Next uh, objective is ovarian tumors. This may have to be split in half uh, to get up on YouTube. And there are basically three types. There's epithelial, which are the most common uh, with the worst prognosis if they are malignant. There's the germ cell cancers, which typically occur in adolescents and children. There's stromal tumors, which are rare but are uh, hormonally active, so they're very dramatic and wind up on the boards. And finally, metastatic ovarian tumors. So first off, for epithelial tumors, they are the most common benign and malignant tumors other than probably the dermoid. If they are malignant, they have the worst prognosis. And they have benign versions, which are cystadenomas, malignant versions, which are cystadenocarcinomas, and borderline versions, which are low malignant potential. They are more likely to be bilateral than germ cell or stromal tumors. They're seen mostly in postmenopausal and perimenopausal women and they present with very vague complaints. And the complaints overlap with many benign conditions, including irritable bowel, interstitial cystitis, endometriosis, depression, chronic pelvic pain, etc. When a patient presents with persistent complaints that you think is one of these conditions, always ask yourself, are you missing an ovarian cancer? So you need to know the five cell types, serous, clear cell, endometrioid, Brenner, and then I separated mucinous off by itself because this one has a different marker. It does not typically make CA125. It's more likely to make CEA. And let me back up a second. Serous cells or serous tumors are more likely to resemble uh, the fallopian tube. Clear cells are more likely uh, to re resemble uh, renal carcinoma. Endometrioid looks like endometrium and Brenner uh, resembles transitional epithelium, so you can always remember that Brenner looks like bladder. And the mucinous tumors tend to look like the endocervix. So the risk factors. This is by far, overall, the most important risk factor, and it outweighs everything else. Ovulation will perforate the lining of the ovary, cause irritation, cause a cyst formation, which may lead to either an adenoma, borderline tumor or malignant tumor. Then everyone's familiar with all the genetic risk factors. There's BRCA1 and BRCA2. Remember that BRCA1, these are misnamed, is a high incidence of breast and ovary. BRCA2 is mainly a higher incidence of breast with about half the incidence of ovary, about 20%. Lynch2 is non-hereditary polyp, non-polyp hereditary colon cancer and that's associated with both ovarian and um, endometrial cancer. And finally, you can have a site-specific ovarian cancer where the primary cancer passed in the germline is going to be epithelial ovary. And then finally, if you go to the March 1986 edition of the Cosmopolitan, there is a world-famous gynecologist who was interviewed uh, talking about talc powder causing ovarian epithelial cancer, and this has been documented from um, several pathology studies showing talc crystals in the middle of the epithelial tumors, etc. And this appeared to, in, to irritate the uh, industrial military complex, and shortly after this came out, amazingly, the FDA issued a rule that uh, talc was not a cause of ovarian cancer. And that oncologist disappeared into obscurity. <clears throat> so how do these patients present? They are vague. They have pelvic pain, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, dysuria, dysmenorrhea. It's not common that they have a major bleeding problem, but they have GI complaints, GU complaints, GN complaints, GYN complaints. They do not usually have hormonally active complaints like you would with a granulosa cell tumor or a Leydig cell tumor. We'll come back to these later. And then finally, after they've been misdiagnosed for a while, they're found to have a pelvic mass and ascites, and the diagnosis is made. Now, the most important marker for this, obviously, is CA125. It's present in the majority of tumors except the mucinous, and there is a major amount of controversy about whether or not this should be used for screening. The current religious answer for your exam is that it should not. And the reasons for it are there are too many false positives, which makes it less specific. And 
The whole reason for doing screening is to catch the disease early, and in stage one, only about 50% of the tumors are positive. So where the majority of tumors are positive in stage three, that's when it's too late, uh, and screening is not felt to be useful. However, there is another group that believes that this is an issue of patient autonomy and that this should, screening should be done if it's asked for, and this is something you'll be reading about. It is a very useful marker if it's positive at diagnosis because you can monitor the patients for response and you can monitor them for recurrence. Now, there's also a lot of false positives, as we mentioned. The primary one is anything that irritates the peritoneum. So diverticulitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, pregnancy, even fibroid tumors, and a major one is cirrhosis because cirrhosis will cause ascites as well as ovarian cancer causing ascites. And if you are given a patient on the shelf exam who has a high CA125 ascites but normal small ovaries, that doesn't rule out ovarian cancer. You can still see that, but read the question carefully and see if they may have another reason for the ascites. Do they have cirrhosis from hepatitis or alcoholism or any other condition? So again, just coming back to this, should CA-125 be used as, as a screening test? Here's the pros. It's the best chance. You can only cure it when it's early. You can use it with certain symptoms, which means it's not really a screening test, and it's the patient's right. The cons are it doesn't do very well in early cancer. It only picks up half of stage one, and you would need to do many surgeries to find one cancer, and studies that have been done both on transvaginal ultrasound screening and CA-125 screening both give numbers of a, over 50 surgeries to find one cancer and many times that cancer was not even an epithelial ovarian cancer. And then there's pushback from doctors when they are told that there's something they need to do. So the warning signs, these are a, just a single list of warning signs for ovarian cancer. You can find many similar lists. Abdominal bloating, swelling, pelvic pain, GI symptoms, vaginal bleeding, urinary symptoms, fatigue, dyspareunia, back pain, or dyspnea. And again, there is an explanation for all of these in terms of common conditions, but if you get a female patient who has persistent complaints like this, it's something that should be considered. Now, on the shelf exam of the boards, what kind of workup are you expected to do for an adnexal mass? Depending on the age of the patient, and we're going to talk about this later, you would get either a CA-125 or a germ cell marker if the patient was younger or a marker for one of the stromal tumors if it was a hormonally active tumor. You should order a transvaginal ultrasound instead of a CAT scan. CAT scans are good for metastatic disease, but if you're trying to evaluate the mast, you want to get a transvaginal ultrasound. You can tell whether it's complex, which means does it have septations, you can tell if it has ascites, you can tell if it has papillary projections, and also you can tell if it has increased diastolic blood flow. Remember that in the OB lectures, they talk about diastolic blood flow being a good thing because that means that the placenta is being perfused. In tumors, this means that there is a higher chance of a malignancy, and it's called the resistance index, and the magic number is somewhere around 0.4. Now, treatment. These patients should, if there's a high suspicion for ovarian cancer, get an exploratory laparotomy. On your exams, no one's going to get into the controversy about doing a laparoscopy. You should remove the mass and get a frozen section. And by far and above, the most common treatment will be TAH BSO with staging. If it's a young patient and it's localized to one ovary, you can do a USO, unilateral salpinga oophorectomy, and staging. And sometimes you'll find that your diagnosis on the final path has changed and you have to go back and do more surgery. Postoperatively, the most common treatment that will be given is a platinum compound and taxol, normally for six courses. And the patient will be followed with CA-125s, physical exams, CAT scans, and possibly PET scans. Now, what is the natural history for ovarian cancer? They ask this stuff. The natural history is response followed by recurrence. So the majority of patients who undergo surgery and chemo will respond. 
the overwhelming majority of patients will also recur after they are in remission. What do you do? And they're not going to ask you to make a choice, but you may see one of these <coughs> as the only option given. So the magic number is six months. If it's been six months since they were treated, these tumors are believed to be, quote, platinum sensitive, unquote. And you may turn around and offer the same chemotherapy again. Or you may choose to offer repeat surgery or an alternative chemotherapy. Or you may offer uh, the patient uh, not do anything. And the natural history of this is once the patient has recurred, they may very well get another remission, but they will ultimately develop what essentially is a carcinomatous ileus, but it's called a SBO, small bowel obstruction. So here's a presentation for the shelf. Here's a 45-year-old female, early satiety, abdominal bloating, pelvic pain, and dysuria. What would be a typical family history? What would be a classical ethnicity? And what marker would you want to order? And here's the tumor. So what we're looking at here, this is what might first strike your eye, but these, are, these could be initially benign cysts. But look at these papillary projections. Look at these thick septal walls, more than three millimeters, and look at this crud on top of the, the ovary. This is a malignant tumor. So if you're looking at this patient here, her typical family history might be breast cancer in addition to ovarian cancer. Remember in BRCA or Lynch, the other cancers are more common. So you may have breast cancer, you may have colon cancer. What's the classical ethnicity? Ashkenazi Jewish, because this started off as a small tribe, and because of founder's effect, there was a mutation that spread throughout the entire tribe. And you want to get a CA-125. Now, next patient is 40 years old. She has no family history. She's not Jewish, and she has a negative CA-125. And this mass, even though it may be the same size as the previous mass, is most likely a cyst adenoma. This is benign appearing. There's no papillary projections. The septations are thin, and there's no crud on the surface. There's no excrescences. And this patient is almost certainly still doing well, at least as far as her ovarian tumor is concerned, where the previous patient is most likely deceased from her disease. The next category of tumors is going to be germ cell tumors, and remember these are both benign and malignant, and the most common one by far is going to be the benign or mature teratoma. <clears throat> For all of these, the major risk factor is young age, under 20 typically, and the exception is dystrominoma because there is a major condition for the boards associated with dystrominoma, mainly androgen insensitivity syndrome, period. So if you see a patient on the shelf exam who is having an exploratory lap and she has a dystrominoma on a frozen section, you want to look at that question carefully and make sure it's really a female patient. Is there a uterus? Does she have primary amenorrhea? Does she have primary infertility, et cetera? And in that case, it's really a male who has a seminoma, and that's covered in detail in one of the other objectives. These tumors grow very quickly, and the classic presentation is uh, an adolescent or teenager is brought in by her mother in a, acute abdominal pain with a swelling abdomen, and this is felt to be a pregnancy or ectopic or spontaneous hemoperitoneum. And they may present as pregnancies because they have HCG, if you're talking about the choriocarcinoma, and in comparison to the epithelial tumors, they're quite curable. So the, these are the four types I would recommend worrying about. Teratoma, there's two types. There's a mature <clears throat> and immature, which is malignant. The dystrominoma, which is also a seminoma in the male, choriocarcinoma, and endodermal sinus tumors. There are two specialized monodermal tumors that we'll talk about in a few minutes. <clears throat> there are also markers that you need to know. There is no marker for the immature teratoma, but the dystrominoma makes LDH, Choriocarcinoma makes HCG, and endodermal sinus tumor makes AFP. There are mixed type of tumors that will make more than one or the other, and also dystrominomas are famous for having other cell types buried in them. 
So if you're presented with a adolescent or even a child who has a, a mass, you want to get tumor markers. You want to make sure she's not pregnant. She will go for an exploratory laparotomy. The mass will be removed. They'll do a frozen section. And here's where it splits from epithelial tumors. Even when the patient has widespread metastatic disease, you can just take that ovary out, do debulking, and give the patient chemotherapy. You do not do a hysterectomy on a germ cell cancer on the boards. The chemotherapy given is commonly BEP, which is bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum. And remember that for the boards, anytime you talk about a chemo drug, what you really need to do is to know the side effect. So for bleomycin, it's pulmonary fibrosis. For etoposide, it's secondary cancer. And platinum is famous for causing the three ends, nausea, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Again, there's always zebras. We mentioned this already. Dystrimonoma may be associated with TFEM. There are some germ cell cancers, and we're not going to worry about which ones for the shelf exam or boards that don't need chemotherapy. These are usually early-stage cancers like a dystrimonoma or an early-grade immature teratoma that don't get chemotherapy. The remainder do. An immature teratoma may re recur as a cancer or it may recur as a benign tumor and this is called retroconversion. And patients may actually present with nodules on the, in the peritoneal cavity, develop bowel obstruction, or they may recur in the pelvis or even in the vagina with teeth. And again, don't do a hysterectomy and a germ cell tumor on the boards. And again, we'll talk about the monodermal tumors last. Next category are the stromal tumors, and there are quite a few of them, but the ones that I want you to worry about are the Leydig cell tumor and the granulosa cell tumor here and here. Heiler cell tumor will mention in passing, it, it is essentially for us, it's a Leydig cell tumor <clears throat> that is normal size. So for Leydig cell tumors, there's an entire separate uh, objective. In fact, there's a couple of them on virilization. And the way to separate this from the other causes of virilization, like congenital adrenal hyperplasia or drug use, um, are that the Leydig cell tumor will give you sudden onset of virilization. And even though it's not true, the patient will say that I woke up today and I look like this. I look like Wolfman Jack. She should also have an adnexal mass. And if you're measuring hormones, she should have an elevated testosterone that is so high that you don't need to worry about free testosterone. The other markers for adrenal problems like DHEA sulfate and 17-hydroxyprogesterone and urine drug screen for anabolic steroids are all going to be normal. If this is your diagnosis, the treatment's going to be a unilateral sapinga oophorectomy. If there's any question about them being malignant and they do occur, they should be staged and adjuvant chemo should be given if they're malignant. And unfortunately, once virilization occurs, and remember, we're not talking about simple hirsutism, we're talking about the pathologic effects, which are clitoromegaly and breast atrophy and balding, may be permanent. The granulosa cell tumor makes estrogen. However, it's very difficult to use that as a marker because it, you may normally have levels of estrogen. So the marker you want to order is going to be inhibin. The majority of these tumors are benign. It's difficult to tell which ones are or aren't going to be. People will use uh, histology, size, necrosis, rupture, etc. And even in that case, the recurrence may not occur years down the road. And this is uh, different than the other uh, cousins, the germ cell tumors, which normally recur very rapidly. And there are two specific presentations that you need to watch for on the boards. First presentation is going to be in a child who shows up with a mass and pseudo precocious puberty. Now, again, there's a separate puberty objective, but remember that precocious puberty is normally under the age of eight or seven, and it, it consists of breast growth, pubarch associated with adrenarch, so breast and pubic hair, growth spurt, and menarch. If you only have one or two of those, you have what's called pseudo precocious puberty. So here is a, let's say, a six-year-old who has breast development and vaginal bleeding, but no growth spurt and no pubic or axillary hair. 
she almost certainly has a granulosis cell tumor. The other presentation that's very classic is a postmenopausal patient who has postmenopausal bleeding. You suspect endometrial cancer, you do an ad endometrial biopsy, you get grade one endometrial cancer, and she also has an adnexal mass. Now that adnexal mass could be METs, but METs are rare, and unilateral METs are even rarer, and this will turn out to be a granulosis cell tumor. How do you treat them? A lot of these patients are young, so obviously you don't want to cause castration, so you can do a unilateral sapinga oophorectomy. If the patient is peri or postmenopausal, you can do a THBSO, and the reason is that these patients are at significant risk for endometrial hyperplasia or cancer. So if you don't do a hysterectomy, you need to make sure that that's not present. There's about a 10% recurrence rate overall, and if that occurs, these patients are offered either repeat surgery or radiation therapy or chemotherapy. And the most common chemotherapy used, I believe, is BEP. Again, bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum. Again, radiation therapy uh, has been offered, but the problem with these tumors, both for chemo and for radiation, is they grow so slowly that it's difficult to treat them effectively. Now let's go back to the Hywer cell tumor for a second. This has the same presentation as a Leydig cell tumor, which is sudden virilization. And you will measure testosterone and find out you have a high testosterone level, so you know that it's not an adrenal problem. But when you do an ultrasound or a pelvic exam, you can't tell which ovary it's from. And back in the prehistoric period, what we used to do was to open the patient up, try and figure out which one looked bigger, and take that one out. Nowadays, we know that we can catheterize the patient's veins and find out which one has the higher source. So ask yourself, how would you do that? Where does the right ovary drain into and where does the left ovary drain into and which one would you catheterize? Now finally, metastatic ovarian tumors. Although there are exceptions on the boards, these should always be bilateral and the most common sources are breast, colon, and endometrial. You can also have metastatic gastric cancer, which is the Cygna cell tumor or Krukenberg uh, tumor. And if you have a patient who has a history of another cancer and she presents with bilateral adnexal masses, I doubt they would do this, but you may need to interpret the question carefully to see whether or not you think she has a new epithelial cancer or this is her metastatic cancer because the management would be different. Let's skip this for a second and come back to it. So there are two specialized germ cell tumors you want to be familiar with. One is stroma ovarii, and this is essentially thyroid tissue. So this is a male or female that presents on your boards with a normal thyroid exam, hyperthyroidism, elevated thyroid hormone, but completely zero for TSH. And this patient has a gonadal monodermal tumor making thyroid tissue, making thyroid hormone, and needs to be removed. Another one is carcinoid, which makes serotonin, and you know from your surgery rotation that carcinoid normally occurs in the GI tract, and it's asymptomatic to what metastasizes to the liver, but this is an exception because these are in the gonads, and they go directly into the systemic circulation. So the two markers you want to worry about are serotonin in the serum, and 5-hydroxyindole acetic acid in the urine. And again, if a patient presents with flushing, wheezing, diarrhea, and a gonadal mass, this is likely. So let's back up a second and look at this. This is a question from the old OB-GYN departmental exam. So tumor, clinical presentation, and tumor marker. So as tumor ovarii would present as I'm sorry, hyperthyroidism and an adnexal mass. And the marker would be elevated thyroid hormone, and you would check TSH to confirm that it wasn't a pituitary source. Granulosa cell in a 60-year-old would present with postmenopausal bleeding in an adnexal mass, and the marker would be inhibit. A Leydig cell in a 15-year-old would present with sudden onset of virilization. And remember that if you're exposed to androgens, your bones will close, and this may be pathologic shortening, and the marker would be testosterone. 
And finally, a 20-year-old referred for primary amenorrhea who has a XY karyotype and bilateral masses. This is kind of a trick question. This is from our puberty objective. But this is somebody who has an XY karyotype, and they have gonadalus genesis, and the gonads have converted into gonadoblastomas or dystrimonomas. And in that case, you can measure LDH. So to finish it off, you can have a Leydig cell tumor, which presents with sudden virilization. You can have ovarian choriocarcinoma, which may mimic pregnancy, or it may also mimic a molar pregnancy in a teenager because you won't find a fetus. A dystrimonoma in a male, or as a seminoma in a male, may present as testicular feminization. That's covered in the puberty objective. And then fallopian tube cancer we've mentioned earlier also. This is an adnexal mass in a menopausal patient who has what you believe is intermittent urinary incontinence with gushing of urine out of the vagina. But on examination, she has an adnexal mass, and this is malignant fluid coming from the tube being squeezed out through the cervix. And that is it.